on C-SPAN 3. Next, on Lectures in History, Brooklyn College professor Casey Johnson teaches a class on Presidents Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon's Supreme Court nominations. He describes Johnson's plan to fill the bench with liberal justices and the difficulties he ran into getting them confirmed. He outlines the pushback from conservative senators in the confirmation hearings and concludes with background on some of Nixon's nominations to the court. His class is about an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, all right, so t today what we're going to be looking at is the development of, of controversial Supreme Court nominations in the late 60s and early 70s. And the backdrop to this, remember last time we were looking at the Warren Court, this increasing surge of controversial decisions from the court with sort of two basic principles. One, remember the idea of counter-majoritarianism, this idea that it was a particular job of the Supreme Court to stand up on behalf of people who may not have majority support, whether it was atheists or civil rights uh, activists um, or criminal defendants throughout the 1960s. And second was the emergence of, of, of this philosophy that some historians have called rights-related liberalism, the idea that, that liberalism in the United States was primarily devoted to the protection of individual uh, rights. And as a result, the Supreme Court became a very important mechanism for, um, for this. One problem, which is that if you're going to you know, govern your, uh, uh, your, your governing approach is going to code through the Supreme Court, you have to be able to appoint Supreme Court justices, and as we'll see, this becomes an increasingly fraught prospect for, um, for liberals. So the backdrop, LBJ. Um, after 64, with the Civil Rights Act, 65, with the Voting Rights Act, he, you know, he has a sense that the Supreme Court is going to be uh, significant, but unlike with Kennedy, there are no openings uh, on the court, so Johnson essentially creates one. First one comes in 1965, uh, uh, there, you know, there's a custom which dates back to, uh, to the Wilson uh, administration with, with Louis Brandeis that there was one Jewish member on the court. Jewish member on the court in the early 60s was Arthur Goldberg. Remember, he'd been appointed by JFK, cements the liberal bloc on the court. Johnson, however, wants to uh, appoint this man, his longtime lawyer, fairly close personal friend and advisor, Abe Fortas, who is Jewish. So he goes to Goldberg and says, you know, look, Arthur, it's very important. We have a problem in, in Vietnam. Um, it, it, it simply can only be handled uh, at the United Nations. You're the best negotiator I know. What you need to do for the good of the country is to resign from the Supreme Court, accept a job as UN ambassador, and Goldberg believes it. He goes off to UN and is basically ignored by Johnson for two years, and Johnson is able to put Fortas in in 1965. Fortas, as we'll see, continues to advise Johnson behind the scenes on important policy issues. He helps to draft Johnson's speeches. So imagine like in the current environment, if John Roberts were regularly consulted on Trump speeches. I mean, this would be seen as highly improper and this will cause problems for Johnson uh, down, down the road. Then second in 1967, Thurgood Marshall. We've seen previously as the NAACP's chief counsel who Johnson had appointed to the circuit court right here in New York. Johnson you know, sees an opportunity to name the first African-American uh, to, uh, to the court, but there's no vacancy. There is, however, a vacancy to the position of attorney general. Johnson looks far and wide in the country and decides that Ramsey Clark, liberal lawyer, would make the world's top attorney general. There's one small problem. Clark's father, Tom Clark, is on the Supreme Court. Johnson goes to Ramsey Clark. He says, I'd just love to appoint you as attorney general, but I can't do it with your father on the Supreme Court. If he says your father is willing to resign as a Supreme Court justice, then I can appoint you as attorney general. The father resigns. Johnson gets another vacancy, and, uh, and Marshall moves on to the court. Johnson assumes he's going to run for re-election in 1968. He's going to be re-elected in 1968. There are three fairly elderly members of the court including two, Justices Black and Harlan, who are not in good health in the late 1960s. So he's working under the assumption he's going to be able to appoint either four or five justices by the time he leaves office. But instead, we all know the history. Johnson's support begins to, uh, to weaken. Uh, and in March of 1968, Johnson announces that he is not going to run for re-election. By the summer of 1968, it seems pretty clear that the Democrats are going to have a tough time winning this election, which means that Johnson's successor, 
is likely going to nominate the replacement for Chief Justice Earl Warren. And so Warren, in June of 1968, decides to preempt this possibility, makes an announcement that he's going to retire um, as Chief Justice of the, of the uh, Supreme Court upon the confirmation of his replacement. So basically what Warren is telling to conservative senators, you have a choice. You can confirm whoever LBJ nominates to take my place, or I'm going to be there as the Chief Justice continuing to issue these liberal opinions, and the expectation is that most uh, members of the Senate will more or less go along with that, even if they don't particularly like the idea of Johnson naming a replacement um, and, uh, and doing so. There's one other thing which is in the, in the mind, back of the minds of both Warren and Johnson. You know, Johnson is arguably the, the most gifted president in American history, and if not the most gifted, the, the second or third most gifted in terms of managing Congress. He had a deep understanding of how Congress operated. He, he had a sense of what he could get through Congress. But as Johnson nominates a replacement for Warren, he is thinking of this chart. So these are all Supreme Court nominations in the last two political generations, dating back to 1937. All the nominations from FDR, from Truman, from Eisenhower, from Kennedy, and from Johnson. And take a look at this middle column uh, here. Most of these nominations are confirmed with the letter V, that means that there is a voice vote in the Senate. The Senate doesn't even bother to hold a roll call vote. It simply automatically confirms the justice. Almost all of the others are overwhelmingly con uh, confirmed by, uh, by the Senate. So by the late 1960s, this become this expectation that, yes, in the Constitution, it says that the president nominates a Supreme Court justice and the Senate has to confirm that selection. But in the real world, whoever the president nominates is automatically going to get confirmed. And this is what Johnson assumes is going to happen in 1968 as, uh, as well. So in June of 68, we'll go inside the Johnson White House in a second, the assumption is that Johnson has outthought his opponents again. He'll get a liberal chief justice on the Supreme Court by late 1968, who will serve throughout the 1970s and ensure that the Supreme Court will remain uh, liberal. Now, there's another chart that Johnson might have wanted to examine but did not, and that's the chart of his declining public support. So the chart here on the left is Johnson's approval as measured by Gallup throughout his presidency, and it goes up and down a little, but there is a pattern here. It goes from quite high in 63 and 64 and drops. So by early 1968, Johnson's approval rating is hovering around 35%. For comparison's sake, that's seven or eight points below what Trump's approval rating currently is. So this is a, you know, it's a very low um, approval rating for, for LBJ. Along with this, the fact that he's not terribly popular, he's not running for re-election. The last time there had been a Supreme Court justice confirmed by the Senate who had been nominated by a president who had announced he was not running for re-election was 1893 rather long time ago, this charming-looking man here, Howell Jackson, who was a uh, Grover Cleveland uh, nominee, served for a couple of years, got ill, um, and died in the mid-1890s. So from this standpoint, there's a good precedent for Johnson. Basically, any president who's nominated gets confirmed. By this precedent, however, you look at, you know, Johnson may have some problems here. He's not a popular president. The Senate didn't have much of a precedent in terms of not, uh, confirming uh, late uh, nominees by, uh, by the president. Now, Johnson is looking at one other vote. He, he, he fails to anticipate where the key opposition is going to come from uh, in 1968. This is the chart that Johnson is looking at. Um, as he's making his selection in 1968. This is the roll call vote for Thurgood Marshall's confirmation in 1967. And you'll notice that this is not a unanimous vote like many of the other uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s nominees uh, had been. There are 11 senators who vote against Thurgood Marshall's confirmation. The 11 are up top uh, on the chart. And if you squint closely, you can pretty much identify where these people are coming from. They're all from the South. Ten of them are Democrats. This is a period where you know, segregationist Democrats remain in place in the South. 
And the 11th is a former Democrat, Strom Thurmond, who was at this point a Republican senator from South Carolina. So in Johnson's mind, as he's thinking about who will be a good replacement for, uh, for Warren, what he's saying is the people I need to sort of preempt is Southern opposition. If I can come up with a nominee that will appeal to the Southerners, then the nominee will sail through uh, without any problem. Johnson, however, makes this a little too complicated. Um, he, he concludes that he does not want to name a new replacement for Warren. Instead, what he wants to do is to elevate his friend, Justice Fortas, from associate justice to be chief justice. And so he wants to come up with a replacement for Fortas as, a, as associate justice. So he's going to have to make two nominations rather than one. Uh, he goes through a number, a number of lists. Uh, but the man he's most interested in looking at is Homer Thornberry. This a photograph of Johnson with Thornberry. This is from the late 50s. He knows Thornberry very well. Thornberry had succeeded him in the House of Representatives when Johnson was elected uh, to, the, uh, to the Senate. Johnson had then uh, appointed Thornberry to the Fifth Circuit of, uh, 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 in, uh, based in uh, 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 New Orleans. Uh, so he's, he's a you know, appellate court judge nominated by Johnson. He is you know, a former congressman. He is very friendly with Southern politicians. He's particularly friendly with Richard Russell, who's the most powerful of the Southern uh, Democrats. So Johnson senses that Thornberry is someone who will appease these Southerners who didn't like Thurgood Marshall, uh, and he will ensure that Fortas uh, will, be, will be confirmed. Now, before Johnson announces Thornberry, he gets on the phone with several key figures to sort of feel them out on what they were thinking. Generally, w w when Johnson would call you, this was not a two-way conversation. Johnson was not soliciting information. He was basically encouraging you to think as he did. So his first call goes to Justice Fortas. Um, and ostensibly, the purpose of this call is to get feedback from Fortas about who would be a good replacement for Fortas as associate justice. But it, it, as, as will be clear, Johnson has already made up his mind. And Fortas's job basically here is just to say yes. Thornberry. Uh... Uh, has uh, uh, some disadvantages, I think. In fact, he's a congressman, a city councilman, a state legislature. I think he'd be awfully good on the court and knowing every department of this government. But uh, from the standpoint of the liberal press that just will not give me a fair trial, hell, I'd be nominated by acclamation on my record uh, for civil liberties and civil rights. But the Times and the, the Post uh, are against me because they're just anti-Semitic, by God. They're anti-South. They just, uh, because I live in Texas, I don't have style. And that's the only damn thing they got against me. I've done their, I've, I've adopted their platform. And uh, I know you've got to go, and I just got to get some more. Uh, how are you going to rate these people? One, two, three, four, five. From the standpoint of my practical problem and, and uh, uh, what I may want to do here on the, all the other things. I've got geography, I've got the Senate, I've got these philosophies, I've got to have sure votes. I've got, I want a little continuity, I want a little age on Now look at this not from your standpoint. Well, look at it from my standpoint of the, knowing me as you know me and what I want. I want somebody that will always be proud of his vote. That's the first thing. I may not be proud of his opinion. Uh, but I, I want to be proud of the side he was on. He may not be as eloquent as Hugo Black or you or somebody, but I want to be damn sure he votes right. That's the first thing. Now, these are private conversations. Fortas is not aware that he's being recorded. Johnson is, does know that he's being recorded. And he's perfectly candid here about what he wants. You know, if, he, if, he gets, if you get a brilliant justice, that would be great. But the chief goal here is to get someone who will vote the way that Johnson wants. And one suspects that every conversation from a president after Johnson had a similar line. I'm sure it did with Trump, uh, with Trump's two nominations as well. But you know, there, there's an obvious point here. Johnson's goal is to ensure a liberal majority on the court. He thinks he can do that with, um, uh, with Fortas and Thornberry. And then Johnson reaches out to key senators. Johnson, remember, was majority leader in the 1950s of the Senate. He understood how the Senate operated in the 50s exceptionally well. His problem will be that the Senate in the 1960s operated quite differently. But Johnson in the 50s believed that he could sort of filter through key Senate leaders. 
So he reaches out to this man, Richard Russell, Democratic senator from Georgia, segregationist, but the most prestigious of the Southern Democrats. Russell likes Thornberry a lot. He doesn't particularly like, like Fortas, but he says he's going to be willing to go along with the nominations because that will get Thornberry onto the court. Johnson reaches out to the minority leader, head of the Senate Republicans, Everett Dirksen, a Republican senator from Illinois. He and Johnson had worked very closely on the Civil Rights Act, on the Voting Rights Act. He was a supporter of African-American civil rights. He knows Fortas. He likes Fortas. He also knows and likes Thornberry. Dirksen commits to supporting him. Johnson also reaches out to Mike Mansfield, who is the majority leader of the Senate, representing sort of liberal, moderate Democrats. Mansfield isn't thrilled about Fortas as a nominee, but says that he's willing to go along with Johnson's plan. So it looks, from Johnson's mind, in late June of, of 1968, as if this is a done deal. You know, Fortas has been uh, 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 nominated, Thornberry is the associate. The three most powerful members of the Senate, Johnson believes, are already on board as willing to support both confirmations. This is just going to be a done deal. Johnson's problem is that you know, he's essentially lost a decent amount of power by the fact that he's not running for re-election, but he hasn't, he hasn't conceptualized that, and he'll learn it very quickly uh, in the summer of 1968. Two things happen almost immediately. The first is that 19 Republican senators sign on to a public statement prepared by this man, Robert Griffin, who was a Republican senator from Michigan, which comes to be known as the Round Robin, and which articulates a view that will reappear in American life in 2016. This is essentially the same argument that Mitch McConnell makes against the Garland nomination, which is that, look, we have a vacancy for the Supreme Court. There's a presidential election going on. We are going to withhold our support from any nominee on the grounds that the new president should be able to make this choice. No, because John Johnson at this point had been elected in 64. What Griffin is doing here is that Griffin has seen the polls. By June of 1968, Nixon has assumed a fairly healthy lead over Hubert Humphrey, who's going to be the Democratic nominee. So when Griffin is saying this, he's confident that Nixon is going to win. And basically what he's saying is, I want a Republican to make this uh, nomination rather than... Uh, rather than a Democrat. If the, the polls were flipped, let's say and we're in an alternative world, and Hubert Humphrey were somehow ahead of Nixon by 15 points in the polls, I suspect that Griffin would have said, you know, let's go along with this. But, but he doesn't. Uh, and he gets a significant chunk of Senate Republicans. So we have 19 senators who are signing on to this, to this statement. And remember, we have 11 senators, 10 of whom are Democrats, who oppose Thurgood Marshall. So at least on paper, we have almost 30 senators who, are, who seem to be skeptical about a possible Johnson nomination. But the Johnson White House staff doesn't detect this. So just at the time that the Griffin round robin is coming out, Johnson's uh, uh, legislative liaison team, it's the office in the, uh, in the White House that basically counts votes in Congress, prepares these documents for LBJ. And what they say is this is this shoo-in. Is we have roughly 70% of the support in the Senate. Um, we have a handful of opponents, but you don't need to worry. Uh, Fortas is going to get confirmed. So on paper, from the president's standpoint, this, this nomination seems to have gone very well. But in reality, there are big problems that are, that are emerging that they don't seem to be detecting. And Johnson privately... Um, in, the, uh, in late June and early July of 1968 is telling his aides that Griffin is bluffing, that yes, there are 19 Republicans who have signed this letter, but in reality, all of them aren't going to vote against Fortas and Thornbury. They'll back down once the nominees make it to the floor. They're just sort of trying to, to, to provide a, uh, a show. This is not what happens, but Johnson doesn't quite, uh, quite understand. Then there's a second problem dating back to Louis Brandeis. Supreme Court nominees had gone before the Senate Judiciary Committee. 
And dating from the 30s, there had been a fairly normal practice where Senate uh, 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 nom uh, Supreme Court nominees would testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee, get asked if their opinions on constitutional issues and offer some feedback. These, these tended to be quite routine hearings, nothing like what we've what we saw in the last few weeks was nothing like what we had seen before, but even you know, setting aside like the Garland hearings, nothing like that where there would be a kind of television spectacle, but nonetheless, you know, the, you'd have to go through the, uh, through the motions. The problem for Johnson is that the Judiciary Committee in 1968 is probably the single most hostile committee to the president and to liberal philosophy that exists in the, uh, in the Senate. Think back a few weeks ago to the Kavanaugh hearings. The Kavanaugh hearings, basically, we have you know 19 member committee, we have you know, 10 uh, fairly conservative Republicans, nine fairly liberal Democrats. It's essentially a, an, it's an ideologically split committee, but the Democrats are liberals who are on the uh, on the committee. That is not the case in 1968. The chairman of the committee is this man, Jim Eastland. It's a Democratic senator from Mississippi, ardent segregationist, had voted against Thurgood Marshall's confirmation, had voted against the Civil Rights Act, had voted against the Voting Rights Act. The second ranking Democrat on the committee, John McClellan, Democratic senator from Arkansas, had been absent from the Marshall confirmation but had made clear he opposed Marshall had voted against the Voting Rights Act, had voted against uh, the Civil Rights Act. And Sam Irvin, who we will encounter again in this class, Democratic senator from North Carolina, had voted against the Marshall Confirmation, had voted against the Voting Rights Act, had voted against the Civil Rights Act. These are the three most senior Democrats on the Judiciary Committee. These are our senators who today would be among the most conservative members of the Senate. They are bitter critics of the Warren Court and the Warren Court's key, uh, key decisions. And so essentially what they decide among themselves, and Eastland is the chair of the committee. The chair of the committee controls how the, the process operates. Again, think to the examples of the last few weeks. The key person in the Kavanaugh hearings was Chuck Grassley, the, the Republican chairman who, who uh, you know, sort of presided over the hearings. What Eastland, McClellan, and Irvin decide is that they are going to use this opportunity to put the Warren Court on trial, to basically bring Abe Fortas before their committee and grill him on a variety of Warren Court decisions. So instead of a routine hearing, what Fortas gets is very detailed questions about specific Warren Court decisions. And he, you know, he, he doesn't give consistent answers. Sometimes he says that he, he'll defend these decisions. Sometimes he says he can't talk about them because you know, he's a justice. He can't talk about how the court made its decisions. And the committee also starts asking questions about Fortas's advice to Johnson which again is highly improper. A Supreme Court justice should not be providing political advice to a sitting president. Everyone knew that Fortas was doing it. Fortas says that he can't give this advice because that would be an improper intrusion into the court's uh, freedom of action. And, and the, the three conservative Democrats say that doesn't make any sense. So you're willing to talk to the president, but you're not willing to talk to the Senate. That seems to be not respecting the authority of the, uh, of the Senate. And Fortas... You know, this is always a problem with Fortas and, and LBJ. Fortas thought like a lawyer. He tended to give these very specific legalistic answers that tended to sound very defensive. He was not a particularly good witness. But the star of the hearing is not any of the Democrats. The star of the hearing is this man, Strom Thurmond. Republican senator from South Carolina, former Democrat, independent presidential candidate in 1948, had flipped to the Republicans in 1964. Thurmond was, you know, Thurmond was a demagogue. You know, he, he sort of understood how to prosper in politics. He was a sharp opponent of, uh, of civil rights. And in Thurmond's mind, the questions that were coming from Fortas and McClellan and Eastland were too legalistic. They, they weren't, he, he feared, they weren't going to you know, attract the attention of the public, make them oppose Fortas. 
He goes over Fortas's judicial record, which is not particularly robust. He's only, Fortas has only been on the court for three years. But what Thurman noticed is that Fortas had frequently been in 5-4 majorities, so on paper the decisive vote, on a series of decisions that the Warren court had made over pornography issues, where the court had struck down state laws restricting the sale or dissemination of pornography on grounds that this violated the First Amendment. And Thurman sensed that this might be a vulnerability to portray Fortas as a pro-pornography justice, someone who was outside of the ideological mainstream. He welcomes, um, as, as a witness, as a, as a member of the minority, they get to invite a handful of witnesses. Uh, this guy, James Clancy, um, who is uh, head, head of Citizens for Decent Literature, uh, an anti-pornography organization. Um, and Clancy describes in quite uh, robust detail uh, the plot lines of various films and books that Fortas decisions had uh, upheld as non-obscene. And this line of attack, that Fortas is essentially a pro-pornography justice, starts to resonate. A lot of conservative uh, uh, members of the Senate begin to sort of distance themselves. Both Russell and Dirksen, these senators that Johnson thought he had in the bag, retreat a bit. Russell comes out against Fortas. Dirksen says he might support Fortas. Uh, he might not. Johnson is trying to figure out what's going on. The problem here is that he doesn't have any close allies on the Judiciary Committee. And he finally turns to this man, George Smathers, who is a uh, uh, Democratic senator from, uh, from Florida, a low-ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, but a close personal friend of both JFK and, uh, and LBJ. And he's trying to get a sense from, 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 uh, from Smathers, why is this committee process taking so long? Uh, and what Sm uh, Smathers tells him is that these senators are very interested in the, in the pornographic films. Indeed, he suggests they, they frequently want extra time to view these films in person to determine their level of, uh, of pornography. And, as we'll see, he's telling Johnson that, uh, uh, he's, uh, that, that Eastland is using procedures to delay things. Because, of course, if it's delayed after... The election, it looks as if uh, 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 Fortas is going to be uh, have, have little chance of nomination. Two contextual items for this clip. The first, Johnson references this film, which was just out, called The Graduate. Dustin Hoffman is the uh, star. The, it's, it's seen as a very racy film in the context of 1968. He's, Hoffman is seduced by the, the mother of one of his, uh, his friends. Um, and Smathers is going to be talking about his own views for, uh, about pornography here. Smathers had a reputation for a very active uh, social uh, uh, life, but that's not the portrayal that Smathers gives of himself in this, uh, in this conversation. Now, uh, you get a uh, feel not like uh, Bob Thurman, you have to listen one hasn't really made much sense. But it gives enough people to to solve the line like this. It, it, it worries me very much. And uh, it invited me back to talk about it. And I just uh, think to you, finally, my first reaction is that he just ought not to come. And just see, uh, and my other reaction is at the moment, you know, Bill went to see the movie, and I said, I'm not going to see the damn movie because I want the institution to say, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think in any kind of goddamn pornographic stuff. It's all over the streets, and always has been. And it's a man's choice. I choose not to look at it, but others may choose to look at it. And if a fellow wants to look at it, why, the court voted that he can. That's a matter of choice. I don't look at it. I haven't seen this, so I'm not passing judgment on whether or not. This is the kind of thing that should be shown around or should. John was preaching and ranting and raving, raving about the, how this kind of thing was running life with grandchildren and everybody else. He wanted a long time to look into this. He was going to look into it very deeply. He ought to go see this graduates. That's right. 
Will you vote on it next Wednesday? Well, we're due to vote on it next Wednesday. Well, won't the filibuster? Yeah, it's going to filibuster again. Oh, in the committee? In the committee. Well, can you just do that, Councilman? Well, with, with the cooperation of Eastman, I don't know how you're going to stop it. What Smathers is referring to down here at the bottom is a rule of the Judiciary Committee that allows any member of the committee to delay the vote by one week. And if you're dealing with a president who's running out of time in office, this repeated delays of, delays of one week are going to cause um, you know, significant, uh, significant problems. The pornography argument resonates with the public. Uh, the Fortis confirmation is the first Supreme Court confirmation in American history that all of us would be at least somewhat familiar with. That is that the public is engaged with the confirmation. They're reaching out to members of the Senate. And the letters that senators are getting, and the, you know, this is, of course, the pre-internet age. You contact your senator's office by, by typing out a letter and writing to it. The, senator, the letters that senators are getting are overwhelmingly opposed. So these are a couple of photos of letters sent to Quentin Burdick, who was a Democratic senator from North Dakota and was one of Fortas's strongest defenders in the Senate. Um, but these are lines from these average North Dakotans who are, you know, concerned about what they're hearing on Fortis, and they're saying that, that Burdick is making too many compromises with the issue of pornography, um, and that you can't compromise with the devil, um, and this is, this is sort of problematic. And so, you know, let's say you are an undecided senator. You're getting all of these letters opposing Fortis. Johnson is not going to be around next year to protect you. There's going to be a new president. You might be coming up for re-election in 1970. If you don't have really strong opinions about this, you might be inclined to say, look, I'm just going to vote no and avoid this, uh, this problem. And so Fortas's support starts to erode quite significantly. Johnson is furious. He can't figure out what's going on. He gets on the phone with Ramsey Clark and starts complaining that the problem here is that Griffin and Thurmond and the Senate Republicans have been spreading too many unfounded rumors about Fortas, so it's time for the Democrats to start spreading unfounded rumors about Griffin to even the, even the score. Um, and again, as we see, Clark doesn't really get a word in edgewise in this uh, conversation. But I just hear every 30 minutes these fellows, they have press conferences, you know, Griffin's on all the time, he's having a big press conference this morning. And they make 40 allegations, and we just get tried and convicted every day. And our side, the other side, doesn't get get in. Uh, get somebody that can write some mean damn speeches that allege some things that they've got to deny. Let them do some research. And so that's what you've got to do. You've got to employ their resources and their talents doing research instead of attacking you. And we don't ever keep them busy. I'd find some reason that Griffin's in this thing. I don't think anybody's ever pointed out that Griffin said a week before the appointment that he was against anybody's point. He wasn't worried about pornography. Anybody look at his face and tell he's not, that doesn't bother him, <laughs> pornography. He was just worried that, by God, he didn't, couldn't make a partisan political deal out of the Chief Justice. And the Republican Chief Justice hadn't, hadn't uh, delayed it and, and uh, played politics with it until he could get in. And that's what he said. He said it days before we even decide to name for it. Somebody ought to point that out. This is sort of desperation. I mean, when, when, you're, when your tactic for getting your Supreme Court nominee confirmed is to say nasty, uncorroborated things about Senate Republicans, you're probably going to lose. Uh, and Griffin delivers the final nail in the coffin for, uh, uh, for Fortas in the early fall of 1968. Griffin was a, you know, he was a quite talented senator. He had made clear that he had heard rumors about Fortas being unethical. Um, if people had information, he says, call my office. Um, and what he finds out is that Fortas had been given a substantial cash bonus, $15,000, which in 1968 is a not insignificant sum of money, to teach a very short seminar at American University Law School. American University is in D.C., you know, less, than, less than a couple of weeks. Um, and that this money had not come from American University. Instead, it had come from a handful of private donors who were friends of Fortis. And this sounds uncomfortably close to being a bribe, that you know, these people are paying Fortis for, to do a token amount of work. The dean of American University Law School Says, says that, yes, $15,000 sounds like a lot of money, but Fortas was doing more than just teaching a class. 
He had to prepare his syllabus. And as we know, preparing a syllabus is very expensive uh, uh, work. I mean, this is not a credible allegation. The committee invites Fortas uh, to come back before it and to explain what exactly he did for this $15,000. Fortas says no. And at that point, the Southern Democrats and the uh, Senate Republicans jointly announce that they're going to filibuster the nomination, that they're not going to allow it to come to a vote, and that the filibuster can only be breached if two-thirds of the members of the Senate vote to end debate. And that, it's clear that's not going to happen. October 1st, the Senate votes. Fortis, by this point, is reduced uh, to hoping for a kind of symbolic victory. He's hoping that a majority of the Senate will vote to impose cloture, and he can say basically a majority of the Senate wanted me on the Supreme Court and these conservatives blocked me. And instead, the final vote is 45 to 43. Can't even get to 50 um, to impose cloture. He would have needed 67 uh, to impose cloture. Um, and at that point, very clearly, the nomination is, uh, is dead. This is October of 1968. Johnson is still in office for a couple of months. And as we'll see, he doesn't quite give up, although this was his, this amounted to his last chance. Fortis withdraws from the nomination the next day after spending 24 hours hoping that he might find a way to, uh, to revive himself. So Warren is still on the court, but he's made clear he doesn't really want to stay on the court. Now, as all of this is occurring, we have a presidential election which is going on, and a presidential election in which the Supreme Court has emerged as a major issue for both of the challengers. George Wallace, we've encountered before, a civil rights opponent, governor of Alabama, 1968 runs as a candidate of the America Independent Party, strong opponent of civil rights. He argues that the Warren Court has exalted the power of African Americans. Of course, he doesn't use the word African American. Um, exalted the power of criminals, exalted the powers of atheists and communists at the expense of real Americans whose positions he's going to uh, uh, take. And he gets strong support in the South, but also fairly strong support in some white ethnic areas in, uh, in the North. It, it, very late in the 68 campaign, Wallace is polling in double digits um, in Brooklyn, uh, in Staten Island, which is his best borough in, uh, in New York City, in Queens, um, and in upstate uh, New York. So he's not just a Southern uh, candidate. And indeed, he poses a problem to the Republican nominee, Richard Nixon. Because if Nixon is not able, if, if Wallace siphons too many conservative votes away from Nixon, Hubert Humphrey, the Democrat, might win with a minority of the vote. So Nixon in 1968 embarks on this quite clever strategy of what's called at the time a Southern strategy, but which, which is actually much broader than a Southern strategy, of challenging the precedence of the Warren Court, appealing to what we would now call a, back, a racial backlash vote, but, but doing so in code. So you don't hear anything from 19, you know, 1968 from Nixon that the Civil Rights Act was bad or that, you know, I'm opposed to equal rights for, for black people. And so he, he wants to sort of leave impressions in the mind. And the issue that Nixon seizes on is crime. The argument that Nixon makes is that the Warren Court has made too many decisions in favor of the rights of criminals and that this has created dangerous situations for, um, for society as, uh, as a whole. Um, and here's an example of a TV ad that Nixon runs in 1968 on the issue of crime. This is a, it's a very cleverly constructed ad because, as we'll see, there's only one person in this ad. We're left to imagine who the person pursuing this woman uh, actually is. Crimes of violence in the United States have almost doubled in recent years. Today, a violent crime is committed every 60 seconds. A robbery every two and a half minutes. A mugging every six minutes. A murder every 43 minutes. And it will get worse unless we take the offensive. <laughs> 
freedom from fear is a basic right of every American. We must restore it. Now, the actual text, the video of that ad, does not appeal to racial sentiments at all. We're seeing a woman walking down the street. Now, if you're a viewer in 1968 and you happen to imagine that an African-American man is following that woman, well, that, that might be just what's in your mind. It's not what Nixon says. So the, the Nixon strategy in 68 is plausible deniability on the issue of race, that he's not stimulating a backlash sentiment. Yes, he seems to be talking a lot about crime, and yes, there seems to be an emphasis on the idea that African-Americans are criminal, but he doesn't really push the, the issue in a way that Wallace does. I mean, there's a lot of kind of overt racist rhetoric that we see from, from Wallace. Were, were those numbers accurate? Yes. So the, yeah, these, these, are, these are perfectly accurate figures. And indeed, in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, there is a crime wave. There are riots in most urban areas in the U.S. starting in 64, continuing through 68. Every summer, there are major riots, you know, one, one time in New York, one time in L.A., um, in, in, uh, in Newark, in Rochester, New York. And so Nixon, you know, Nixon is not inventing the crime issue, but the, but the answer that he's giving is a kind of you know, simplistic uh, 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 answer. That, how does that, do you know how that compares to, like, now? Crime's sort of a, like a historic low. Yes. So the, the, we'll, we'll talk more about this when we get to the, the 80s and 90s. Violent crime rate is way, way down from the, from the 60s and 70s, although the, 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 the severity of these crimes have, has increased because the, the power of weapons has increased in some respects. But you know, murder is down, armed robbery is down, muggings are down. This is a period which is a much more you know, dangerous period, if you want to use that, uh, uh, than, than is the case today. So, yeah, Nixon is not inventing the issue, but he's, pre he's presenting a particular frame on the, um, uh, on the issue. Like, yeah, so the, 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 the other policy backdrop here is that after the assassination of King and the assassination of Robert Kennedy, Congress passes a Crime Control Act but the primary thrust of this act is a gun control measure, a fairly weak gun control measure, but nonetheless a gun control measure. And so from Nixon's standpoint, the underlying argument is Johnson and, and, and liberals in Washington are interested not in protecting this you know, woman walking down the street. They're interested in protecting, they're interested in taking away or limiting the rights of guns for, um, uh, for, for Americans. Nixon overwhelmingly wins. So Johnson in 1968 had carried 44 of 50 states, but by 1968 Nixon basically sweeps the country. Wallace carries a handful of states in the south. The only southern state that Humphrey carries was Texas. Now as all of this is going on, Johnson is still trying to come up with a scheme to put a replacement on the Supreme Court. And what he thinks is a possibility is to use the recess appointments power, this very obscure uh, constitutional clause that you know, was commonly used in the 19th century but had started to fall out of fashion in the 20th century that said that when there was a federal vacancy and Congress was out of session on a recess, the president could name a replacement that would serve until the end of the next congressional term. And so what Johnson is thinking in, late, in late, late October, early November of 68, before this vote, maybe what I'll do is Congress is in recess. I'll name a recess appointment as chief justice. You know, it's not going to be Fortas. We're not going to come up with this complicated scheme of, of a two-for-one two replacement. But name a liberal. And the liberal that he, he sort of seizes on is Arthur Goldberg, the, you know, the former justice who he had driven out of the Supreme Court in 65, and the hope was that if he named Goldberg as a recess appointment and Goldberg was in place when Nixon became president, that Nixon might be somehow pressured to nominate Goldberg for a full term. That, the chances of that happening were, were not high. Nixon figures out what he's doing, and so almost immediately after Nixon wins the election, Nixon issues a public statement inviting Earl Warren to remain in place for the remainder of the term, basically saying he doesn't want a recess appointment. And Johnson concedes that the game is up. He calls Warren to sort of complain about this situation. 
this, like his conversations with, with Fortas, you know, it's a quite improper call because basically we have Johnson and Warren trying to come up with a scheme to replace him. But this conversation is from November of 68, and this is the last time that LBJ thinks of the possibility of a, uh, of a Supreme Court uh, nominee. Well, the press will be asking us what right does Nixon have to say that this will go in January the 20th. That does, have we committed that we will not name anyone. Well, that leaves me in a bad shape with Goldberg. Now, what we have said to Goldberg is this. I've told people who have talked to me in his behalf, A, that I don't think he could get confirmed, and I think it would be tragic for his life. But B, if uh, there were evidence that, uh, that I was wrong, I would certainly uh, want to preserve the court if I could, and I, I, I have, uh, uh, I, I would uh, certainly regard him as a good appointment. Well, so would I. Uh, so now that's my problem with him. So uh, I don't think there's much chance, but I'm afraid he's not going to understand what has happened here. He's going to be thinking that I've been playing and uh, knowing all the time that this might happen. So I hope you'll explain to him what did take place. In a typical Johnson call, the other person does not really get in much. Um, but Warren gets the message. Warren calls Goldberg. He says, look, you know, we, we tried for this recess appointment, but it didn't work out. I'll remain in place for the remainder of the term. And he finally um, resigns in June of 1969, at which point Nixon nominates this man, Warren Berger, fairly conservative judge from the Eighth Circuit, which is based in the Midwest. Berger was based in Minnesota to become Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And so we replace a quite liberal, very liberal, Chief Justice with a fairly conservative uh, Chief Justice, and so that creates a more conservative court. But this is only Nixon's first appointment. Nixon will get to make four Supreme Court uh, appointments all in his first term. It's a significant turnover. The second is an unexpected one. Justice Fortas. So one of the great ironies of this is that Johnson, by trying to name, promote Fortas from associate justice to chief justice, paves the way for Fortas to collapse entirely and to be removed from the court. So we're in late 68. Public has been exposed to this idea that Fortas is a little ethically challenged. You know, we have this $15,000 deal at American University. He seemed to be consulting with LBJ inappropriately. I mean, it, it was clear this guy was not a paragon of ethics. And the press starts looking into Fortas' background. And there have been rumors around. Fortas was a very, very high-priced lawyer before he went on to the uh, Supreme Court. And so join, you know, be being a public servant cost Fortas a decent amount in terms of finances, his friends would try to prop him up. Uh, and then in 1969, it comes out that Fortas had been accepting a retainer every year, $20,000 payment um, from a financier named Lewis Wolfson, who unfortunately was under criminal investigation. Generally, for those of you who are planning careers as Supreme Court justices, it's not a good idea to be accepting an annual payment from someone who is subject to criminal investigation. This is highly, highly unethical uh, conduct. But the irony is this probably never would have come out but for the fact that the press had been prompted to look into Fortas as a result of the 1968 fight. Nixon starts sending out rumors that if Fortas does not resign, that Republicans and conservative Democrats will seek to impeach him. And it seems not implausible that Fortas would have been removed from, from office. It certainly would have been a very difficult fight. Fortas concludes that you know, the integrity of the court is such, I need to resign. Uh, and in the summer of 69, Fortas steps down. So Nixon gets a wholly unexpected vacancy. This is a guy who was appointed in 1965, who everyone assumed would stay on the court at least through the 1970s, and now is out after four years. So Nixon goes to the Justice Department. In 1968, Nixon had used this Southern strategy, this idea of, of, of sort of approaching the racial backlash uh, as a way of getting Southern votes. But remember, go back to the, uh, to the map. Nixon doesn't carry some Southern states. So he loses Texas to, uh, to Humphrey uh, and loses Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia to George Wallace. So Nixon and his advisors say, look, 
why don't we try to use this vacant Supreme Court appointment as a way of appealing to Southern conservatives, showing them that if they affiliate with the Republican Party, they will get a concrete benefit. The Warren Court, to put it mildly, was not popular in the South. So if they can get a Southern conservative onto the court, Nixon concludes that will be a way of, uh, of sort of bolstering Republican support. And there seems to be a quite good judge from North Carolina on the Fourth Circuit, which is a, a appellate court on the mid-Atlantic states, uh, named uh, Clement Hainsworth. Uh, conservative judge, very pro-business, very popular um, uh, among North Carolina Republican types, a Republican nominee at a time where there were not many Republican judges in the South, because remember the South had basically been a one-party Democratic uh, area. The problem is that, that Hainsworth, Hainsworth actually has a pretty good judicial record, but not a great judicial record. Um, you know, there's some rumors of ethical improprieties. He had a couple of votes on civil rights uh, issues that uh, civil rights groups perceived as not particularly uh, supportive. A group of young liberals in the Senate kind of embittered by what happened to Abe Fortas uh, in 1968, decide that they don't, they're going to fight against, uh, against Hainsworth. Ted Kennedy, Democratic senator from Massachusetts, very young Ted Kennedy at this point. He'd been elected to the Senate in 1962 to take the seat that his, uh, that his brother uh, had, uh, had once occupied. Kennedy is named to the Judiciary Committee, becomes a prominent figure on civil rights issues, one of the Democrats' point people on civil rights issues throughout the 1960s. Birch Bayh, his son will later be a U.S. senator from, uh, from Indiana, later governor of Indiana as well. Bayh served three terms from Indiana, which was a very conservative state then and now. He narrowly was elected in 62, narrowly re-elected in, 60, in uh, 68, narrowly re-elected in 74, and then finally gets crushed in 1980 by Dan Quayle, who will later pop up as George H.W. Bush's uh, uh, vice president. But Bai was, uh, was a very creative uh, thinker, someone who basically didn't temper his opinions. Even though he was from a conservative state, he basically took liberal positions. Um, he was a Democratic activist on constitutional um, uh, issues. And he is uh, critical of Hainsworth as well. He's worried that if Hainsworth gets on the court, the result will be uh, a string of anti-civil uh, rights decisions. The striking thing about the Hainsworth vote, however, is not that Kennedy and Bayh oppose him. That's some ways to be expected. It's that we have all of these red dots on the, uh, the roll call chart. These are Senate Republicans who cast votes against Hainsworth's confirmation. This is, remember, it's still a time where we have conservative Democrats and liberal uh, Republicans. Um, Clifford Case, the last Republican to be elected to the U.S. Senate from New Jersey. Uh, his last election is in 1972. Very liberal Republican, more liberal than lots of uh, uh, Democrats. Jacob Javits, uh, the last of the New York liberal Republicans. Will stay in the Senate from New York until uh, until 1980. Margaret Chase Smith, Republican senator from Maine, declaration of conscience against Joseph McCarthy, a fairly moderate uh, uh, Republican uh, as well. Charles Mathias, Republican senator from uh, from, Mar from Maryland. Basically, every liberal or moderate Republican in the Senate, and even a couple of conservatives, Robert Griffin, the guy who had led the opposition to Fortis, Charles Goodell short-term interim senator from New York uh, State. His son is now commissioner of the NFL. Um, the father was a more prestigious figure than the, uh, than the son. Um, the, the, you know, Goodell had been appointed to the seat after um, RFK's assassination uh, and is hoping for a full term if he can get, uh, get elected in 1970. And so Hainsworth goes down to defeat, 55 to, uh, uh, to 45. Um, and Nixon is astonished. And Nixon assumed that this was going to be, you know, that he was going to be a safe aim, that, that, that the Fortis confirmation was a one-off. What seems to have happened here is that the Fortis confirmation changed the rules of the game, that the Senate became more willing to look at Supreme Court nominees with a degree of skepticism. 
Um, and as we'll see over the next several weeks, that pattern continues uh, uh, at several points in the future. So Nixon at this point has two options. The first is to, you know, to, to take a look at this roll call and to conclude that this is a democratically controlled Senate. The Republicans are not the majority. And there are some liberal Republicans. And to conclude that in that kind of Senate, there simply is not a majority for a very conservative Southern judge who might be perceived as hostile to civil rights. And so Nixon needs to look elsewhere. That would have been the reasonable response to this vote. Nixon often did not take the reasonable response to votes, and this was an occasion in which he did not. He goes to his aides and says, look, I want another Southerner. If he's more conservative than, uh, than Hainsworth, that's fine. Um, I don't particularly care, but it has to be another Southerner, if at all possible. So the Justice Department takes a look at appeals court judges from the South, the level below the Supreme Court. They don't find anyone who would be appropriate, who would be a Republican, um, who was a Southerner, um, who seemed to be of a sufficient age to be on the, the Supreme Court. But they say there's a district court judge, the lowest level of the federal judiciary. From Florida, from the Northern District of Florida, this man named G. Harold Carswell. Um, and they tell Nixon, you know, he's, he's not perfect, again, because he's not an appeals court judge. The traditional path for Supreme Court nominations, even at this point, was you wanted to move up from the appeals court to the Supreme Court rather than jumping up all the way to the district court. But they say he's a Republican. He's very conservative. Um, if you want to go with a Southern conservative nominee, he is your man. Nixon says, that sounds great. We'll nominate him. There are two problems with the Carswell nomination. The first is that, that Hainsworth did have a couple of votes that were hostile to civil rights, but there was no indication that Hainsworth was racist or, or that he was personally hostile to African Americans in any respect. And indeed, he would stay on the circuit court after his, um, uh, his defeat uh, for, you know, for several years and, and was well-liked by both by both parties. I mean, you, know, he, you, know, they're, 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 you might have liked his votes or disliked his votes, but he was not personally problematic. Carswell, on the other hand, before entering the judiciary, had run for public office, not in Florida, but in Georgia. It doesn't appear as if, if, as if the Nixon people had picked this up. And in 1948, running for uh, state legislature in Georgia. He had delivered a speech saying that he was in favor of segregation forever, um, disparaged the idea of racial equality for African Americans. So if, if, if Hainsworth is unacceptable because of his civil rights positions, Carswell is going to be worse. But Nixon pushes Senate Republicans. He says, look, we can't let the Democrats do this to us twice. You, they blocked us with, um, uh, with Hainsworth. You have to stay with me on Carswell. It looks as if Carswell, despite this embarrassing vote, might make it through. But then a second problem emerges. So district court uh, opinions get appealed to the uh, appellate courts. For the most part, district court judges get it right. You don't see tons of uh, decisions that are over appeal, uh, that, are, that are overturned by the appeals court. You know, sometimes it might be 15 or 20 percent. Carswell, on the other hand, had seen his opinions overturned at a higher ratio than any other district court judge in the country as of 1969. And a lot of these were not cases where, let's say, Carswell was making an anti-civil rights decision, an ideological decision, and the court, the appeals court was saying, no, you can't do that. These were technical decisions where Carswell seemed not to be understanding the basics of the law. There quickly emerged a, a consensus among both parties that, quite apart from his beliefs, that this was a man who was not particularly smart, um, and whether that was a good nominee for the, uh, to be on the court. And this becomes crystallized in Senate debate. The, 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 uh, the Republican point person is a Republican senator from Nebraska named Roman Horoska. And Hruska's argument for Carswell is that the mediocre people of the United States deserve representation on the court as well. <laughs> you can't have all Brandeis's and Frankfurters and Cardozo's. This is a very peculiar argument for a Supreme Court uh, justice. 
And so for, for, for Senate Republicans who had been inclined to go along with Nixon, even though they didn't like Carswell and they didn't like his civil rights opinion, swallowing this is an argument that the mediocre are entitled to representation and that's why we should confirm Carswell um, is a bridge too far. Um, and Carswell goes down to defeat, although by a narrower margin uh, than, uh, than Hainsworth, 45 uh, to 51, um, and Carswell uh, is, uh, is gone. And as if confirming the argument that his uh, critics made about his intelligence or lack thereof, Carswell uh, decides that he will give up his position, life tenured position on the federal judiciary, to run for the U.S. Senate from Florida the following year in 1970. He is absolutely certain that he will be reelected, that he'll be elected and he can become a prominent national figure. He doesn't even get the Republican nomination uh, and he's never heard from again in, uh, in political life. And at that point, Nixon concludes, all right, we're not gonna get a, uh, a, a Southerner, at least a Southern conservative in this particular environment. He goes to the Justice Department and says, get me a conservative um, who will be an acceptable nominee. And the Justice Department turns to Harry Blackman, close friend of Warren Burger, assures Nixon that Blackman is a, is a reliable conservative. He will vote the Nixon way on uh, judicial matters. Blackman, we will encounter next time as the author of the Roe versus Wade decision. By the time he leaves the court in the early 1990s, he is the most liberal member of the Supreme Court. And so you know, it's a reminder that these, these confirmation battles can have lasting impacts. So rather than Hainsworth, a very conservative nominee, or Carswell, basically an incompetent nominee, uh, the country gets Blackman, a very liberal nominee on Nixon's part. So Nixon gets a second uh, uh, justice, but it does not go as well as he, had, uh, as he had hoped. There are two final Nixon uh, confirmations. Both come in 1971 almost back to back. Justice John Marshall Harlan II, grandson of the great uh, Justice Harlan, uh, falls ill uh, in the summer of 1971, resigns from the uh, court and dies a couple of months thereafter. Justice Hugo Black, appointed to the court by FDR in the 1930s, uh, suffers a stroke in September of 1931 and dies a couple of weeks later. So Nixon all of a sudden has two uh, vacancies. The Justice Department has found a Southerner who will be acceptable. This man, Lewis Powell, from Virginia, fairly conservative, but an establishment type, the chairman of the American Bar Association, um, and so acceptable to Senate uh, Democrats. He is easily uh, confirmed. But Nixon goes to justice and says, look, what I want is a strong conservative, a principled conservative, someone who will fight for conservative ideas on the court. That's the first obligation. But the second obligation, Nixon says, is you know, ideally what we'd like is someone who will help us for the 1972 campaign. This is set late 71. The 72 campaign is gearing up. And Republican polling suggests that a particularly soft area for Democrats in 1972 are northern white ethnic voters who are concerned about issues like crime and the Vietnam War and what they see is the Democrats as being too friendly to hippies and to radical students and not concerned enough with, with hardworking union voters. Um, and in particular, ethnic voters, Catholic voters, Polish voters, Irish American, Italian American in New York City and Chicago and Cleveland and Detroit and in, in, in key nor, uh, northern uh, areas. And so Nixon presses the, uh, the Justice Department to see if they can find a good conservative ethnic uh, nominee. Now, the problem here is that this is the point where, for the most part, Catholic voters tended to be Democrat. Dwight Eisenhower had nominated a Catholic in the 1950s, Justice Brennan. He turns out to be very, very liberal, so the court wants to avoid uh, uh, this. So Nixon gets on the phone to sort of press uh, uh, the Justice Department. Here he is with John Mitchell, who is his attorney general, to see if there is an alternative to Rehnquist, someone who will be very conservative but also might satisfy ethnic uh, 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 political desires. Now on the other thing, John, on the second one, if it comes, <clears throat> can I urge you to, to try to examine everything to see if you can find a Catholic, a good Catholic. 
No, Christ, no, that's what I mean. I mean, no, if you went down that, the Eisenhower administration went down that track before, you know. They got Brennan. No. But you don't have an honest to tell you, do you? Uh, yeah, they're awful hard to find. The poll? Uh, no. William Frank Smith, he is. He? Oh, Christ, no, he's a Protestant. Rich and everything else. All right. Well, take a look at the Catholics, will you? I do. Politically, you're going to gain a lot more from the Catholic. Look, the Protestants are just figured through. If he's a conservative, a Catholic conservative is better than a Protestant conservative. We really need that. Well, the point is, it'll mean more to the Catholics than my point than it will to the Protestants. The Protestants expect to have things. The Catholics don't. Well, about uh, after I die. You know what I know. There aren't any. Never. This is not exactly a reassuring conversation about an administration that's looking for high qualifications to the court. Uh, Mitchell does his due diligence. He concludes that there are no acceptably conservative Catholics to, uh, to nominate, and so Rehnquist is selected. And of Nixon's four nominees, Rehnquist is the one who most closely fulfills his, uh, his vision. He's a, you know, he's a strong conservative. He's very smart. He had come to Washington in the 1960s, having worked for Barry Goldwater. He will remain on the court through the Bush two years. Um, he eventually will be elevated to be Chief Justice by Reagan, and we will be encountering him over and over again uh, uh, over, uh, over the course of the semester. So essentially what we have is a transformation of the court from a very liberal court to a much more closely divided court with a strong conservative in Rehnquist, a fairly conservative Chief Justice in Berger, kind of moderate conservative uh, justice in Powell, and Blackman, who will become liberal, although Blackman in the, in the 70s is more centrist or even center-right. He sort of drifts to the left in the, beginning in the late 1970s. And so what liberals discover uh, is that you know, they had assumed in the, uh, in the 60s that they'd control the court for another generation, and the court could issue a series of decisions that would protect individual rights regardless of what the public was saying, but if you don't control the Supreme Court, you can't really rely on that as an approach. And as we'll see next time, uh, when we look at some of the social controversies of the 1970s, liberals struggle to, uh, you know, to, once they no longer have the court, to figure out a way to advance their cause, uh, their cause politically. So any questions from this, this material, things that were not clear? Oh, yes, and wait for, wait for the yes, Richard. I would like to take you go back to the Southern strategy when um, Mr. Johnson had predicted that once he passed the civil rights bills that they would lose the South for 100 years, was that an open discussion that he had made that public or he had just basically thought that privately? So that, that's a conversation he purportedly had. It seems to have occurred, although this was a rare Johnson conversation that wasn't recorded, with Bill Moyers. So, but he never said it publicly. And in fact, what Johnson does, in, especially in the 64 election, continuing really at least through 66, is to try to come up with a new Southern coalition. He assumes, correctly, that Democrats are going to struggle with white, rural Southerners. Most of these people were critical of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, and they, you know, these are people who vote for Wallace in 68, and they'll vote overwhelmingly for Nixon in 1972. George McGovern, who's the Democratic nominee for president in 72, doesn't get 25% of the vote in Louisiana and Mississippi in Alabama. But... Johnson does not think that it's impossible that the uh, South will remain democratic. Instead, what he's hoping for is to create a new coalition of African Americans who now have the right to vote. So he wants them to register. He wants them to get out to vote. And urban, better educated whites, um, especially from places like Atlanta or Charlotte um, or New Orleans or you know, Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston in, uh, in Texas who he thinks are going to be more, you know, they might be moderate, they might be pro-business, but, but he thinks that they'll be open. That is a coalition, to some extent, has started to form in the last few years, especially in a state like Virginia or in North Carolina. But in the, in the late 60s and 70s, that coalition never quite forms. We'll be talking about this a little more next time, in part because urban conservatives are just, cons white conservatives in the South in the 70s are just conservative. 
but also because there are tensions within this movement in the South, especially over issues around public schools, um, where African Americans in the South are saying, look, we want to go to integrated schools. If we have to have busing to achieve that, we're going to have busing to achieve that. And you have well-educated you know, urban whites in the South who say, you know, we want our kids to go to good schools. Uh, we don't want them bused halfway across, uh, across town. So it turns out that Johnson's hope that he might be able to create a narrow majority of whites and blacks to compensate for Civil Rights Act does not come to, come to fruition. Now, if Johnson had been able somehow to run in 68, he probably would have been a stronger candidate than, than Humphrey. He might have carried a few southern states, but the, but the Democrats are on their way out in the South. The only Democrats who do anything in the South after LBJ are Jimmy Carter in 1976 and Bill Clinton in 1992. These are both white Democratic governors from the South, and they both are running kind of atypical, atypical years. Um, so, like, we saw a lot of clips today from the, the phone calls and everything, but we know the... Um, we know the... Wow. I messed up. Why'd you give me this? <laughs> <laughs> the, the controversy around the, uh, the Nixon recordings, I was unaware that um, LBJ was recording his phone calls as well. Was there any backlash to that at all? That maybe not to the Nixon extent, but anything at all? This was wholly unknown. So Kennedy also had recorded. So Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon are the three presidents who extensively record. None of, and, and these are, you know, these are brilliant political minds. Not, neither Kennedy, nor Johnson, nor Nixon realize that they are creating a record that could be subpoenaed. At this time, this is pre-Watergate, these are the president's personal property to do with as they saw fit. And so in theory, Nixon, as we'll see next time, Nixon could have destroyed the tapes. What Johnson was taping for, Kennedy taped for, for historical posterity. He wanted to use the recordings to serve as the basis for his memoirs. Johnson recorded because Johnson did deals on the phone. You know, he was basically wanting commitments from people. So he wanted a record in case people went back on him with his deals. He could say, look, you know, you told me on September 22nd that you were going to be with me and I have a recording of this. But no one else knew. So when, when the Watergate hearings break and the, the Nixon tapes are revealed, the assumption at the time is that the only person, who, only president who ever had recorded was Nixon. And then they kind of sheepishly come out that Johnson and, uh, and uh, 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 Kennedy had also taped. There's a small amount of taping in Eisenhower, Roosevelt, and, uh, um, and FDR, but, but insignificant amounts. And this is just, you know, for our purposes, this is just, these are incredible historical sources because they kind of bring us inside the Oval, the Oval Office. There are no presidents who tape after. Um, Nixon, because they understand they could be uh, they could be subpoenaed, but you, you know the, you can imagine other technologies. Email in the late '80s and early '90s. Apparently, the Bush administration did a lot with email because it's a new technology then, and they didn't realize they were creating a permanent record. Text messages in the Clinton administration. Again, you know this idea of creating permanent uh, records, but we have no other no other tape. you argue that Nixon was a politician first and a president second? Like, based off this argument, yeah. it seems like he was just, like, trying to find out, you know, how can I get elected next? Yeah, N N Nixon is a foreign policy president. Nixon's goal is to deal with foreign policy, um, foreign policy issues. And so, for, in his mind, domestic matters, the goal of a domestic matter is to get him reelected. Um, and so this, you know, he, he wouldn't have done deals like this on, you know, with, with domestic actors on China or the Soviet Union. That he cares about. Who's on the Supreme Court? He doesn't particularly care as long as it will serve his political purposes. And that's a pattern you see with Nixon on a whole bunch of domestic issues, not just the, the Supreme Court. Isn't it interesting to see, like, the integrity with the whole, whole like, the chief justice, the sitting justice, being able to, like, have a conversation about being, he's basically being swayed in his decision. I guess that also goes back to Hamilton as well. Like, what he thought what the justices were supposed to be, it's kind of like going to the far left. Right. right. I mean, this is, you know, one of the things with the tapes, this, this is 
this is highly inappropriate behavior. You know, you know Fortis should not be having private conversations with, um, you know, with, with LBJ. Rehnquist should not be kind of cooperating with to the degree with, with, with Nixon. Rehnquist does recuse himself from, from, uh, from Watergate hearings. And you have to assume that these kind of conversations occurred you know, with Truman and with FDR and probably with Eisenhower. It's just that we don't have recordings of, uh, of these conversations. So you know, to some extent, we have moved towards a more ethical Supreme Court. I mean, it's highly unlikely, for instance, that in 2015, Elena Kagan would you know, head off to the Oval Office and chat with President Obama. You know, she recognized that that, that sort of thing would be, would be improper. But neither Fortas nor Johnson see anything wrong with this kind of, uh, of conduct in, uh, in the 1960s. And you have to assume, you know, let's say there was a constitutional challenge to a Johnson bill. Could any of us really be confident that Fortas would look at that dispassionately and say, you know, I think this is unconstitutional, so I'm going to vote against LBJ even though I really like him? You know, it, it does raise questions of, uh, of partiality. This then comes tumbling down, this issue of judicial ethics next time with Watergate. So that's, wh- that's where we are, uh, where we're at. Quizzes and a couple of the, the midterms are up, uh, are up front. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3.